Okay. Well, welcome everybody to the service today. Um, we have, uh, uh, just to let you know, uh, I am the liturgist and this is my first time ever doing this. Um, so I, I remember a, um, there was a German uh, philosopher who once said that there's magic in beginnings. Um, and I hope there's some magic in this, but something tells me there might also be some mistakes. Um, anyway, uh, we have our uh, our guest ministers uh, for December is, is Reverend Elizabeth Perry, and in January we will have Reverend Linda Terry Chad. Um, uh, today is Communion Sunday. It's the first Sunday of the month, uh, so please, if you have elements, we're we're doing this online or we're doing this via Zoom. So if you have elements, please remember to bring them close to you right now because we will be doing. Uh, a communion later on. Uh, and um, let us please note that it's it we're, Christmas is on the way. It's Advent season. Uh, and on December 24th, Christmas Eve, we will have two services, uh, one at six o'clock and one at 11 o'clock p.m. Both, in both cases. Uh, we now ask that everyone pray for all those who are sick and healing for those who are grieving and hurting, and please special prayers for Mike Jett on the passing of his nephew, and for Rosa Augusto, Amelia Turner Everett, uh, who are recovering, or who are continuing to recover from health issues. Um, we, as you all know, we have a care committee. If you would like to join it or, or speak to someone on it, you can call any deacon or anyone else who is on the committee. Uh, those members include Laura Jett, Cassandra Hawkins, Yang Huang, Emily Mufuti, and Betty Sheets. Uh, the Sunday School, the Church in the Sunday, the Church in the Garden Sunday School is still going strong. Uh, meets every Sunday at 10:45 and 11:30 a.m. on Zoom. Currently, we have 11 students. Um, and everyone, uh, the Christmas season is also, of course, when we get involved in the Briarwood Shelter. Uh, we are having an angel, the angel tree for Christmas. Rama will post uh, information in the link in the chat right now. Okay, thank, thank you, Rama. Um, uh, we will have silent prayer and meditation. Uh, it, we, there was a break, but now it's back every Tuesday at 7 p.m. during the Advent season. The Advent season is, uh, it began on November 29th and it runs straight until December 24th. If you have any questions, please contact Cindy Herendine, <clears throat> uh, who is part of the transformation team. Her email is right there. It's C-I-N-H-E-R-E-N-D-N -E -E at AOL.com. Um, <clears throat> surprised that Google hasn't taken over Cindy too. Um, so there are some more announcements in the weekly word, uh, which everyone should be getting either electronically or in paper. If you are not receiving the electronic publication and you would like to, please call the or email the church office. Uh, it also goes under the headline, the latest news for you. <clears throat> now, today we have, uh, I guess we can say backed by popular demand, we have a pastor who is very well known to all of us. She's been here many times. Uh, she doesn't really need an, uh, an uh, introduction, but she is the Reverend Elizabeth Perry. Kind of exciting. She's actually coming to us from her home office in Astoria. So she's in Queens as we speak right now. <laughs> nice to be with you all. <laughs> um, this is you, I think. It is me. <laughs> in both the Gospel of Matthew and in Isaiah, a messenger appears as a sign from God heralding a new era. In each passage, the words do not be afraid appear, offering a clue that the messenger, whether prophet or angel, was referencing something that induced fear in the recipient. A new way of being together, of relating and loving takes courage eschewing the present order, excuse me, uh, the present order of things so that a new and a better day can be born. <clears throat> Please join me in the litany. The emptiness of loneliness. The emptiness of loneliness. The wounds inflicted. The wounds inflicted. The fear of the other. 
the fear of the other. Let us pray together. Holy One, we thank you for the glimpses we catch of your gift of daring love. Even in the midst of fear, of challenge, of struggle, even when we cannot see a better day when we will act like the human family we are, unite the flame of love within us. That we may glow with its brilliance from inside out. Help us to face this fear of difference and dare to see what love can do. Amen. <clears throat> we will now be uh, moving to lighting the Advent candle. The second candle of Advent is uh, love. And I invite you to light your Advent candle along with me as Mike lights the candles in the sanctuary. Amen. Okay, if we're ready, the opening hymn today is Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. Again, the opening hymn is Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates.
one of the activities in this series of, of services for Advent and Christmas is about sign language. And we're going to uh, put that to use in the 6 p.m. service on Christmas Eve, but I thought that it might be good to practice some signs each week. So today, since the theme is love, I thought it'd be good to share that practice in, um, of, of that word in our sharing of the signs of peace. And in sign language, there's several ways you can say, I love you, and you can see pictures of them there. Um, the first is to hold up the thumb and the first and fourth finger and then move slightly from L to Y. Uh, the second is just to simply cross your hands on your chest. And then the third is to make the L and then the Y. I'm not very coordinated, so I'm probably going to choose to do the very simple one. Do whichever one of those feels uh, right to you as you share the signs of peace and love with each other. The peace and love of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Uh, the first reading today is from Isaiah. It's chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Again, the first reading is Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as the grave or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I won't ask. I won't test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, Listen, house of David, isn't it enough for you to be tiresome for people that you are also tiresome before my God? Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. The young woman is pregnant and is about to give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. The gospel reading comes from Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew 1, uh, and it's uh, chapter 1, eight, uh, verses 18 to 25. Again, the gospel reading is from Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he had decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, of course, means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as an angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. Joseph called him Jesus. So um, I've probably mentioned it before, but I love doing genealogy research. This year makes, I think, the 50th year I've been doing genealogy. But I have a glitch in my family history. I have a problem with my great-grandfather. Uh, I have a picture of him, and I have forms like his death certificate, social security forms, those kind of things, and a couple of newspaper articles about him, but I can't find anything factual about his parents. Uh, family lore tells me some, some uh, things, maybe stories about him, but over time I've come to really distrust those stories, and that's really because of another relative, my father's aunt. Uh, weird on Grace, he always called her. Uh, I don't know all of the reasons why he called her that, but in my genealogy, I see some. Um, I see her name show up on forms like that death certificate, that social security application, all sorts of things for different people. And they're all using different information as if she had just made it up as she rode along. According to her, my great-grandfather's father was born in Maryland, 
but also according to her on a different form, he was born in Germany. It's very weird and it's very frustrating. So while I was uh, reading the scripture from Matthew, um, I was thinking about her. Uh, we didn't read it, the liturgist uh, Rob didn't read it, but there's a very long record of Jesus' ancestors in the middle of that scripture. Um, it's a record that's also listed in Luke, but there it is a very different thing. And both of those lists are very different than genealogy lists that are in the Hebrew scripture. So I wondered if Jesus had ever looked at his family tree and had the same kind of frustration that I have. You know, did he ever wrinkle his forehead and, and wonder what was going on with them? Did he wonder if he had some weird Aunt Grace who was changing the details as it suited her? But as untidy as those lists may be, and as different and maybe even weird as they are, um, they still have important information to tell us, theological information about Jesus' ancestors, important information about the people who, you know, laid a foundation of physical and spiritual DNA for Jesus' life. And while we don't know much about them, we do know enough to have some theories. We can even guess at their even when moments where belief was hard, their ideas about justice, about what uh, their daring right relationships might have been like, and maybe about their love. And all of that does in turn tell us something about Jesus and the people around him, and hopefully it can tell us something about ourselves as well. So first, you know, I've got to talk about the women in the list, right? <laughs> they are huge in this genealogy because rarely do women ever show up in the lineages in Hebrew scripture, let alone the four women that are named here in Matthew. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. So I want to read just that little bit of the list and I want you to see if you hear what might be uh, Jesus' equivalent of weird Aunt Grace's voice. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Aram. Aram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of, the, of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. The list goes on and on and on. And it ends with Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. There are a lot of theories for why those women might be here. Uh, the first I ever heard uh, was that they were all women who had some sort of sexual impropriety in their lives, but who were ultimately found to be more righteous, more just than the men around them. And that would have been very important background for Mary, the unmarried fifth mother in the genealogy of Jesus, who, uh, you know, by the common justice of her day, should have been stoned to death for her pregnancy. But there's also other theories. Um, Tikva Farmer Kensky says that stories about women were placed in Jewish scripture at all the major turning points in Jewish history, even when moments where it might have been hard to believe that something special was happening. And that might have been important for the early church as it was moving from being a part of Judaism into being more of a separate religion. There's a different theory, which is that each of these women represent outsiders to the Jewish faith who are vital to Jewish history. And that information might have been powerfully important to the early church when it was becoming more and more inclusive of Samaritans and Gentiles. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, loving the strangers and the foreigners, the different, and building daring relationships across ethnic lines was part of what the whole church was about. But there's other theories too. One, I think, is that these are all determined women who got what they want. Tamar wanted the son that Judah had denied to her, and she found a way to make him give her justice, and she got two sons in the deal. Rahab wanted safety for herself and her whole family as the walls of Jericho rattled, and she made sure those she loved were safe. Naomi wanted security for herself and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and between the two, the two women plotted to make sure that Boaz gave Ruth and her family that security. 
Bathsheba wanted her son Solomon to be the heir to the throne as David had promised that he would be. And on David's deathbed, she stepped in to make sure that that promise was kept. Even when the odds were against these women, they believed that they could make a difference in human life, that their relationships could bring about justice for themselves and for others. And they accomplished what they wanted. Even when they appeared to have no power, they used the power of love to create a better future. They show us what Jesus will be like. They also preview for us the women who we'll find on the pages of the gospels, don't they? Women who were Jewish or Gentile, some who had some sexual or gender related problems attached to their stories, some who were seeking justice and daring new relationships. They were determined women who traveled to Bethlehem on a donkey, who reached out to touch Jesus' robe, who argued with Jesus that their child was worth saving, who asked for their children to have honored places at Jesus' side, who called out a disciple for his faithlessness. They were women who were present at the cross, accompanied Jesus' body to the tomb, went back to that tomb to find it empty. They were women who risked a daring right relationship with Jesus. Their stories clearly pointing to a turning of the arc of history, passing on to him their difference, their determination, their DNA. But we can't skip over the men in the genealogy either, can we? Because there's a long list of them. And here we come up with a, with a big challenge. But before I get to that challenge, I want to say that this, this long list of men's names that follow Solomon, Solomon there are just a few of them who did right in the eyes of God, uh, as the Hebrew scripture says when they're describing these uh, leaders of Israel. <clears throat> one of those was Josiah. Um, he was a person who found himself in one of those even when moments. Uh, he became the king of Judah at eight years old. And when his father, and his father was assassinated, which is what put him into the role of king. At 24, he ordered the restoration of the temple, which had been falling into disarray. And when they did that, they uncovered lost scripture, the book of the Lord. And that's when we see Josiah, just like those women, standing at this turning point in history. He could have ignored that rediscovered scripture, but he used it instead to re reform Judaism. And he renewed the daring right relationship between Israel and God. Even when those who had come before him did evil in the eyes of God, as scripture says, he and a couple of other men in this list were able to stay faithful and do good. They were able to love God and do good politically and spiritually. And they, like the women, became part of Jesus' DNA and tell us something about him. And we see men like them in Matthew's gospel too, don't we? Joseph and the Magi and John the Baptist, all of them seekers of justice a Roman centurion, a tax collector, a synagogue leader pleading for his daughter's life. They all formed daring right relationships with Jesus and watched history turn. But here comes the challenging part and the part that as a preacher, I wasn't quite sure what I was gonna do with because those other men, those other leaders in the list, the ones who did evil in the eyes of God, they are right there among Jesus' ancestors. And the ones who sometimes did good and sometimes did evil, they're there too. But then we see them in the Gospels as well, don't we? Herod and his death squads, Pilate who washed his hands of Jesus, some religious leaders who thought Jesus didn't wash often enough, and Jesus' brothers who tried to silence him but later became disciples. Even his 12 friends, you know, they were in just faithful relationship with him but they were also faithless and doubting and treacherous. Perhaps when Jesus thought about his ancestry, he was frustrated by it, but maybe he looked at that list and he just thought, even when? Maybe he thought something like this, even when my ancestors weren't the best people they could be, even when they might've been evil or just plain weird or different, they are still my foundations, they are in my DNA, but they are not my future and they cannot block my opportunities. And I can choose to carry with me only their goodness, their righteousness, their determination for justice at this turning point in my history. And maybe when he looked at all the people around him, he thought something similar. 
even when they're terrible, even when they're fabulous, even when they disappoint me, even when they delight me, they are here at this turning point in history and faith with me. They love me and I love them. They are the daring right relationships that will help turn our arc toward God. And then I thought maybe Jesus thinks the same thing when he looks at us today. Maybe he thinks even when they get it wrong, even when they suffer and they struggle, even when they don't understand, even when they do it right and flourish and work it all out, even then, even now, my relationship with them is one of daring love, overcoming all their differences and moving the arc of human history, the arc of justice ever further towards God's kingdom on earth. And maybe you and I, spiritual descendants of Jesus and all his family, maybe we could do the same. You know, maybe even when our lives, our family situations, our loves, our society, our world's ideas about justice, when they're all just a little weird or a little too different from what we want them to be, even when those who came before us are right here with us, even when they are not, were not, are not, what they should or could be. Even when we struggle to exist in this world, to hang on in for any love for ourselves or each other, even then, we can believe that we are here in this time and in this place to take on Jesus' spiritual DNA that has come down to us and use it to love others and to help the world turn toward justice. Amen. Our litany of belief says that even when humanity disappointments or when we disappoints us or when we disappoint ourselves, it's important to name and claim the consequences of that. And it's also prophetic to name and claim our belief that daring to love each other as God loves us is a faithful response to all of it. So I ask you to please join me in these statements of belief. I believe that we have been taught to fear one another and I believe that we are capable of learning to love. I believe that our society is built on a foundation of oppression of some over others and I believe that we can speak this truth and move to act in ways that balance this inequity. I believe that we are afraid and I believe that we can lean on each other and God for courage to face anything. I believe, we believe, even when we are discouraged. We believe that when we are discouraged, raising our voices for justice will bring about more love in the world. Amen. And now as we turn to a time of prayer, I invite you to get into a comfortable position. Uh, to be as quiet and as still in this time as you can be, uh, maybe with your eyes closed or fixed on your Advent candle. Uh, I apologize that my candle is now out because it was leaving off a scent that was causing my lungs to close up. But take as deep a breath as you can. Mine's probably going to be more shallow now. And let us pray. The gentle pool of God is often lost amidst the rush of all the obligations which lay a claim on us. Yet just beyond the frantic pace of restless, our restless feet have trod, lie deep still pools of quietness, the dwelling place of God. Now take me to that sacred place where lost in wonder and in awe, the moment comes and I rejoice to be and be with God. Meet me in the stillness, Lord. Be the air I breathe. Meet me in the stillness, Lord. Free me to receive. In the stillness and silence, I invite you to share any prayer requests you might have at this time. You can unmute yourselves and speak them aloud or type them in the chat. <clears throat> I'd like to pray a prayer of thanksgiving for a new granddaughter 
um, mom and baby are healthy, but uh, Lord, I ask for your prayers to keep them healthy and keep uh, Carla's blood pressure down so that she can go home and be with the family at home. Yes, Lord. Congratulations. <laughs> For all these prayers of our words, our typing and our thoughts, we give you thanks and prayers, praise that you are with us in it. You meet us in the stillness, Lord. You free us to receive your blessing. Amen. And now let us prepare to share our tithes and offerings. Hello. If you would like to donate, there are three ways you can make a contribution. Uh, the first is to send a check to the church. Uh, the address is in the screen. It's 50 Askan Avenue, Forest Hills, 11375. Or you can set up a bill payment through your bank to have checks mailed to the church. And finally, you can do it through PayPal. Uh, go to the church website and click on the upper right corner on the donate link. Uh, Rama has also included uh, the information in the chat. Now please hear the prayer of thanksgiving. God of all blessings, source of life, giver of grace, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the mystery of creation, and we thank you for the beauty of love.
So I invite you to uh, gather your communion elements together and to uh, be in an attitude of prayer as we enter into communion. Please join me in the litany. Our God, song of the ages be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to raise our voices with you, tuning ourselves to you, creator of heaven and earth. You filled the night of creation with music and light setting in motion, the rhythms of sunrise and sunset, of sound and silence. You formed within us your love song and breathed us, it breathed into us the breath of life. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Breaking forth into light from the blessed darkness of a womb, he brought light that illumined a path so we could see our way to more beloved community. Your spirit anointed him to raise his voice, to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners, and invited us to do this too. Born into a world of suffering, he suffered. Born into a world of senseless death, he died. Born into a world that needed hope, he rose, delivering us and proclaiming light and life, the triumphal coda of life's song. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us your love and light so that our hearts may be broken open for the world and our lives poured out in service. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Mix our voices in harmony with each other until we sit at the same table and sing the same choir in your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God now and forever. Take your elements and eat and drink of the body and blood of Christ. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And part of the... Uh... The beautiful thing about this uh, this series, this worship series, is that um, we end with a carol of resistance. Um, our carol of resistance was written in 1849 by Massachusetts Unitarian minister, Reverend Edmund Hamilton Sears. One verse has been left out of several um, hymnals over the decades, 
since, but then the new hymnal, Glory to God, restores this powerful verse that re refers to the love song of the angels being drowned out by our warring nature. Yet with the woes of sin and strife, the world has suffered long. Beneath the angel's train have rolled 2,000 years of wrong. And we at war on earth hear not the love song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise and cease the strife and hear the angels sing. Let us be reminded that we are to listen to the angel chorus and then join in it, raising our voices with the message that love, not hate, is the answer. The closing hymn is It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Again, the closing hymn is It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. If you can, uh, please pick up this week's candle and hold it high for the benediction. In this season of waiting, know this. We wait for justice, but we do not wait to work for change. We wait for restored health, but we do not wait to work to heal. We wait for wholeness, but we do not wait to work at binding brokenness. We wait for peace, but we do not wait to work to eliminate hatred. And so my friends, like the bells ringing out the news that God is with us, Emmanuel, continue to fill the night left by sadness with messages of love. 
go into your lives, humming the tunes that keep that love alive in you and that spur you on in your work of justice and reconciliation. Please raise your voices and repeat after me. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. In the name of the creator, the redeemer and sustainer, go out unafraid in the grace and love of God. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Prairie. And as always, thanks to the praise band. Yes, thank you all. Fine uh, talent. So we had uh, Harris, who is also our cameraman today, and Mike, who is lighting uh, the candles. So they can do many, many things in addition to being a musician. But seriously, we're, we're very grateful for all the gifts of um, this congregation. And we hope you know to, to bring people back in when, when they feel comfortable. And um, it's, it's great being here and uh, broadcasting from the, the sanctuary into your homes. So I hope you feel the presence of God and uh, you know, this church in your life. It is a beautiful space. It is, definitely, definitely. Uh, okay, well, I guess it's coffee hour now. Does anyone have coffee? <laughs> no. Glenda, did you remember to make coffee? Oh, yes, okay. I got coffee. Why? <laughs> Rob, 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 wonderful. You did a beautiful job, Rob. Is your voice wonderful. is your voice affected from the COVID that you had? Oh, I've rec I recovered. Um, for the past like five days, I've been back to normal. Oh, good. Oh, God good. bless. 
Praise the yeah. Lord. Great, you wonderful. Thank I was you. Lucky. Great job. Thanks. And thank you, Reverend Perry. It was lovely oh, to see you again. Thank you. It's lovely to be with you all. <laughs> see you all. You know, Reverend Perry, in my family, I'm the crazy uncle. So uh, are you? <laughs> Uh, that was oh my gosh. There's a lot that's weird about her. Um, I remember going to her house when I was very, very small. And I remember the family getting a letter from her because she, she had the same last name that my parents did, but she spelled it completely differently than they spelled it. And I remember my mom showing me the envelope and look at how she spells our name. <laughs> but when I look up in the genealogy record, she died two years before I was born. Wow. Oh, so I don't have any idea. I don't know. I don't have any idea where those memories came from. <laughs> I don't know. Something, Very interesting. She's, she's, yeah, she's a, she's an interesting nut on the family tree. <laughs> Pecan tree. Makes life interesting. <laughs> it does. It does. Uh, Imagine if you just had a boring family, what would you say? Oh, wouldn't that be terrible? <laughs> <laughs> they might think of me that way. That could be. <laughs> I'll be boring Aunt Beth. <laughs> Wonderful to see everybody and to know that you're all here in the same space um, because we all have um, a community of believers and uh, God bless you all. Yeah. And thank you. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate this family of believers. Oh, yes. Even though we don't see each other physically, but we have each other in our hearts and we pray for each other. Amen. Amen. And, and thank God for blessing us all. We're all still here. 2020. <laughs> we made it this far. We'll probably make it the rest of the way too. <laughs> Hope so, Connie. <laughs> Hopefully, 2021 will be a better year. <laughs> yes. yeah. Can't get any worse. <laughs> don't say that, Betty. Don't, yeah, don't say that. <laughs> don't say it. Don't, don't, don't well, tempt, I, I'm tempt God that. that. I am hoping for that. <laughs> yeah. We have, to, we have to do a lot of praying. <laughs> yeah. the Lord is turn things Keep around. hope alive without uh, without falling uh, Reverend falling Perry, into that. I love, I love your tapestry over the, on, the, yeah. on the wall. Yeah, yeah. Quilt. I think it's a quilt. Yeah, oh, it's, it's a lovely. quilt. It's lovely. Beautiful. It's lovely. I love it. Uh, it, it came from, I probably, I may have said that before to some of it, it came from a next door neighbor uh, of mine when I was a little girl. She was uh, an elderly friend of my grandmother when my grandmother was what I thought of as elderly. That point was, <laughs> she was probably younger than I am now. But, um, <laughs> but she made the quilt and my grandmother inherited it from her when, when the woman died. And then my mother got it when my grandmother died. Oh. And when I went to seminary, my mother sent it with me to have on my dorm room oh, uh, bed. Oh, how yeah. wonderful. It's, it's I think wonderful. it's probably a hundred years old. Oh. Exactly. The quilts could talk, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. It would tell you don't go to seminary. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, uh, how yes? is your uh, your sermonizing coming along? Oh no, uh, my my exegesis uh, classes. Yeah, it's fine. My 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 uh, professor gave me the the marks yesterday, and uh, I passed. So. Yay! Yay! When I hear the book of Ruth, I can give it to you in Hebrew. I can give it to you in English. So. Oh How exciting! <laughs> well, let's hear. You, should, you should talk to. Uh, it, it, I don't know if it'll show up in the lectionary anytime in the next couple of months, but uh, you know, talk to the the preachers and see if you can join in. It'd be fun to do that. I've done sermons with other people before, and it's fun to do those. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it, there's only one pulpit, so it's probably best to have one voice. <laughs> well, a little of your voice would be lovely. Yes. Yeah. In time, I'm sure. 
<laughs> I actually did a dueling sermon not too many years ago with somebody who had a completely different interpretation of the scripture than oh. I did. <laughs> and I got up and I preached mine and then I turned the pulpit over to him and he preached his. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. <laughs> Well, that's that's just one word. Just <laughs> 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 Betty Sheets, you're home. I'm home. Yeah. I'm home. I've been home for two weeks now, and it's great. Absolutely oh. great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you look happy. That's good. Yeah. Still doing the therapy, though, and it's slow going. <laughs> so pray for me. On that. You look great, Betty. Thank you. Thank you. And Adam, is it snowy out there in Colorado? <laughs> there is no snow at this time except on the top of the mountain right out my window. Wow. There is snow there in July, though. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> huh. Well, I think that I need to uh, say goodbye, and I will see you all next week. God Looking bless. Forward to you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.